Welcome to This Week in Hearing and our featured series, Giants in Audiology, a series that introduces those that need no introduction. Today, my guest is Dr. Jerry Northern, and Dr. Northern's humble bio reads, Jerry Northern is a professor of, was a emeritus at the University of Colorado School of Medicine in Denver, Colorado. He's president of the Colorado Hearing Foundation and serves on the board of directors of the Marion Downs Center in Denver, Colorado. Dr. Northern retired from the faculty at the University of Colorado School of Medicine in 1996 after 26 years at the hospital as professor of otolaryngology and director of audiology clinical services. Dr. Northern is an, a, a major teacher to all of us, has done numerous consulting with various manufacturers. Also, he was an inspiration to those of us that were his students at one time or another, because we all wanted to do what Dr. Northern was doing. Uh, further, he has actually been an ambassador for audiology all around the world. Welcome to This Week in Hearing, Jerry. Well, thanks, Fox. Nice, nice to be here. And uh, I'm not sure I should be included among the giants of uh, audiology. I'm only five foot ten, and in my older years, I seem to be shrinking a little bit every every year. But those of us that that came up in Colorado stood on people's shoulders, and yours, and of course, we didn't want to stand on Marion's shoulders too much because that would that would that would not have been polite. But um, so. Uh, I uh, the first thing we have to talk about is that uh, there was you've had a wide uh, practice within the field, a wide scope of consultancies and saw the profession go from body aids, actually probably no aids, all the way through cochlear implants. And I, I still remember as a student at the medical school, uh, a, a study called y cord versus binaural hearing that was presented at the International Hearing Aid Seminar and uh, with Marion Downs and yourself and uh, Sam Leibarger. It was the idea that uh, I didn't really do too much, but I got to be on a paper. And how cool was that? So my understanding is you, you've done this ambassadorship to 30 or more countries. Well, thanks. Uh, I've been a lucky guy. I think I've been around during the golden age of audiology. So uh, I just had so many opportunities and found myself luckily in the right places at the right time. And, and it's been just a, just a fabulous career for me. And, and uh, I'm delighted for any contributions that I've made to, to the success or the progress of audiology. Uh, it's, it's been my pleasure all the way through. So you have kind of a unique connection to hearing impairment and hear and deafness and those kinds of things. And I know that the group would be interested in hearing about those. Well, yeah, it is pretty unique. I certainly never in college had any interest in uh, speech and hearing. In fact, my, I went to Colorado College and I was an experimental psychology major. I, I wanted nothing really to do with uh, uh, hearing and speech. It meant nothing to me, except that. Uh, my parents were divorced uh, when I was very young, two years of age. Uh, I was sent to live with my grandparents, with my older brother, and they were profoundly deaf. They're both profoundly deaf graduates of Gallaudet uh, College from in the early 1900s. So we found ourselves as little boys uh, living in a house with, <laughs> with grandparents who were totally stone deaf, and we had no means or ways of communicating with them. So we had to learn sign language rather quickly. So that means I learned sign language at the age of two, so it's always been like a, a second language for me. My grandparents had, had two children, my father and my aunt, both normal hearing, because my grandparents lost their hearing through spinal meningitis, uh, which used to go through the country like, a, uh, uh, like just a giant uh, epidemic, leaving lots of people with profound hearing loss. But because they were uh, adventitiously deaf, it didn't really pass on in my family. Um, their daughter, my aunt, um, normal hearing, went to Gallaudet. She became a teacher of the deaf and taught for 40 years in Kansas, uh, California, uh, around. Um, then I came along. 
Uh, I went to Gallaudet, actually. I have a degree and a master's degree from Gallaudet. And, uh, my daughter, Amy, became a teacher of the deaf. And believe it or not, my granddaughter uh, was a teacher's aide over in the school for the deaf um, in, uh, in Seattle. So um, interesting, we've had five generations of our family involved in deafness in one way or, or another. Well, you have to compliment the grandson, the grandparents there for taking you and your brother in, as you say, as wild grandsons uh, within this, uh, this particular thing, situation. And, and I guess that you had a VA traineeship in Denver that kind of led to the PhD and the Army and a number of... Uh, actually, actually, when I was a Gallaudet, um, I had to take a course in, in hearing, you know, in hearing and deafness or something over in the Hearing Speech Center. And that was my first introduction to audiology. And I had two great mentors uh, that were on the faculty at that program. And um, I'd go down and watch them do audiology with the, the deaf students at Gallaudet. And I found it fascinating. In fact, it was really sensory psychology with a clinical application. So I thought it really felt my, uh, fit my, my educational college background in, in psychology and my background with, uh, with deafness and my grandparents. So. Uh, it wasn't very long for me, even for me, to put that together and say, wow, that, that could be a great opportunity here for a, a career for me. So that, that started my route to audiology. And uh, subsequent to that, I quickly got a VA traineeship in Denver in audiology. So that brought me back to Denver for a few years while I worked on my PhD. Thank you very much to the VA. That was, that was terrific. And I got the grand stipend of about $4,000 a year. Now, that's kind of what degrees cost at that time. Uh, now they cost only slightly more than that, of course. Um, now, um, were you the first Army audiologist? Well, um, no, actually, I was the second. Uh, I wanted to be the first, but somehow a speech pathologist snuck in ahead of me, and I don't know <laughs> where he ever went. He, I never met him, and, and he disappeared some way along the way. Um, I was... I was commissioned uh, in the army, uh, in the armor. So I was a small unit commander for tanks. Um, <laughs> my, my commission, I, I kept getting deferments. This was during the Vietnam years. I kept getting deferments to go to graduate school. Uh, there was no specialty in the army for audiology at that point. And then suddenly, just as I finished my PhD, the army was bringing back enough hearing impaired active soldiers from Vietnam they really needed an audiology program. And so they, at that point, uh, set up a specialty MOS, uh, um, specialty assignment for audiologists. I had a, an ENT friend who was in the military at Fitzsimmons Army Hospital in Denver. He called me and said, Jerry, now's the time. If you want to switch branches, you could get into the Medical Service Corps as an audiologist. So you could bet how fast I wanted to get out of uh, tanks and armor. And into audiology. And so I was able to apply almost right away. And yet, darn it, I was still the second guy, not the first. Bummer. Well, uh, I also understand you're the you're the founder, one of the founders of the Military Audiology and Speech Pathology uh, Society. <laughs> <laughs> Another funny little story. Uh, I was at Walter Reed Army Medical Center at that time. I was on active duty uh, as a captain. Uh, I was this assistant director there, the Army uh, Speech and Hearing Center. Um, and we, uh, I applied for funds to attend an ASHA convention. And I got an answer back, this would have been in 1969. I got an answer back from the Surgeon General that they were not funding people to go to conventions. After all, we were in a Vietnam War and that was really just not a uh, priority. I got a phone call from a PhD friend of mine who was an audiologist in the Air Force, Dr. Jim Endicott. And he had just happened to him as well. I thought that over. And so uh, uh, working with him, we established the Military Audiology and Speech Pathology Society. And we justified that would be, uh, we reapplied for funds to go to the ASHA convention. Because now we had an organization that needed to meet. And we needed to meet face to face so that we could standardize audiology protocols with all three services, Army, Air Force, and Navy. I don't think there was a Navy person at that time, but nonetheless, 
all of a sudden we got funding approval. That sounded like a good project to the uh, military. And so we got to go to convention. <laughs> so we did. By that time, we had half a dozen audiologists. We, we met together one evening, had a dinner. Uh, we even had a talk, and Ray Carhart was our speaker. Wow. Ray came to the first military audiology and speech pathology. And, uh, and that's how that all got started. It was sort of a boondoggle, I, I really have to admit. But I'm proud to say that organization has lasted all these years. It took a few years for the, audi the audiologists and the speech pathologists to split away. We needed the numbers in those early years. So we were military audiology and speech pathology. But each group went their own way. The military audiology group has survived all these years. They are now called the Military Audiology Association. But boy, a huge number of audiologists over the years have gone through that organization. They now hold their own conventions. They're a very uh, successful group and a, a valuable uh, audiology organization. And I, I certainly remember that in my, my reserve career uh, as a military audiologist, where, where we had Army short courses and we had Military Audiology Association meetings. It, uh, from what you started, it turned it into a fabulous educational experience for military colleagues. Um, now, one of the other questions I have for you, did, were you the guy behind the military monograph issue of uh, audiology today? Uh, yes, of course. So during that part of my life, I was the editor and, pu and publisher, as a matter of fact, <laughs> of, of audiology today. Those were in the early years of uh, the American Academy of Audiology. And so we put Audiology today, six times a year, but that wasn't enough. I wanted to have some special issues. And so along the way, usually once, at least once each year while I was the editor, I would pick a topic and have a special issue devoted to that topic. Well, I had a very good friend in Mo Bergman, who was uh, one of the very earliest audiologists. And he had had a real, he had had a career in working, I think, at, uh, at one of the military hospitals uh, after the Second World War. So he would have been one of the really first audiologists and he'd been around, he'd been very interested in military audi audiology. Talking with him, I believe over a dinner one time, uh, I just realized he was a mountain of uh, information about that and invited him to do a special issue on military audiology, which he did while he was teaching in, uh, in Jerusalem, I think. He was really, uh, by that time, well into his 70s, I think. But it turned out to be quite a nice history of the growth of audiology before we even had audiology. I think that's probably one of the best historical orientations to the field that that I, as one, have ever seen. And uh, now, now here's a mystery that uh, I've always wondered about. Uh, there's a picture of a soldier in the sound room uh, in front of a great big dynamic microphone. Uh, now. <laughs> And there's another dude back behind the scenes there. Um, are you either one of those guys? No, no, no. Those are both before my time. And those are pictures I found while I was at Walter Reed of, of the post-World War II um, hearing testing evaluations. I had maybe a dozen of them. And I just used, uh, I turned those over to Mo Bergman, and we included all of those in that special edition of Military Audiology that came out of the audiology today. Well, that's another myth that has been busted then. <laughs> uh, now, uh, uh, now, you came to the University of Colorado Medical Center in the mid-1990s. and No, no, no. I came in 1970. 1970, okay. And then uh, met a fabulous lady by the name of Marion Downs. Well, I actually knew Marianne before that. So when I was had my VA trainee, the VA hospital was right next to the medical center in Denver in those days. And uh, met Marianne, got along nicely with her. And as a student, she would hire me to come over and cover her clinics uh, while she did international travel or while she was on vacation or whatever. They had a very busy outpatient uh, clinic in audiology. Uh, she was the only audiologist on the staff at that time. And she would hire me at the uh, grand uh, paycheck of five dollars an hour <laughs> over and cover this clinic. And so, in a half day, I would we would see forty people, just one after another, after another, after another, to feed uh, nine otolaryngologists, as I recall. So that's how I met her. When I was at uh, when I was on active duty at Walter Reed, I got a call from her that they had an 
opening uh, in the department and that uh, the audiologist who filled that uh, position, Gary McCandless, had just accepted a position over in Salt Lake City and was leaving. And would I be interested in coming back to Colorado uh, after my military career? So I kind of thought about that. I, I did take the trip to Colorado. I did interview with everybody uh, on the department. But I had some really good research projects going on in uh, Walter Reed, one in uh, oral rehab, especially programmed educational things in oral rehab. And I said to Marion, you know, thank you very much for the offer, but I've just got a little more I need to finish up here. And she said, how long would it take? I said, uh, I think another year. And she said, that's fine. We'll just hold the position open for you until you're ready. Well, I didn't think that really happened, but lo and behold, uh, they did hold that position. I finished my research uh, in 1970, and by golly, they offered me a job. I did have to take a paycheck but to go back to Colorado. So I went down from, I went to $16,000, I think, was my annual first uh, paycheck pay rate at the University of Colorado. So uh, as they used to say on the billboards around the state of Colorado, it's a pleasure to live in Colorado, uh, meaning don't worry about not making much money because you're having a good time in the mountains. Well, the, the chairs of the departments, all when you asked for a raise, they always went over to the window and opened up the blinds <laughs> and said, here is about 25, 30% of your salary. <laughs> so, so I know that one relatively well. Uh, but you and Marion went on to do lots of publishing, lots of speaking, lots of, and, and, uh, and we all remember the high risk register and the high risk register turned into that that uh, kind of a bank uh, drop uh, 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 bag of all kinds of different noisemakers and all these different things, and uh, uh, as well as six editions of a textbook called Hearing in Children, and uh, now published, I think, even in three languages around the world and, and so on. So that's a, you know, I, I, we, could, we could spend this whole this whole interview time talking about Marianne Downs, and that still wouldn't cover this grand lady. She was a, she was the most colorful, masterful, best audiologist that probably ever lived, and it would be hard to, to ever replace her. But so it turned out to, when I was hired, I had a PhD, and she had a master's degree at that point. So the university structure was such that I had to come in as the head of the department with my PhD. But there was no doubt working with her. Uh, I was a trainee um, and uh, spent my career, frankly, riding on her coattails. She was just a beauty. The best part of it was that we just met and matched and worked together in a marvelous way. Uh, we never had a crossword between the two of us. We both uh, uh, worked together and, and got so much done. Uh, it was just incredible. It was a fascinating time of my life, those 26 years. Uh, and she just turned out to be, be the best in the world. I just can't, I can't say enough about her. She was bright, creative, inventive, always up, uh, ready to go every single day, no matter what was ahead of her. She just had an optimistic view that something better was just around the corner, no matter how bad things were looking. She was so optimistic. She was just ready to move on to the next thing. Great. And, and as you say, we could spend the whole interview talking about Dr. Downs. My pleasure to be part of a group that lobbied hard at the University of Northern Colorado for uh, the honorary doctorate for Marion, and, uh, and as well as a number of other colleagues around the world that were lobbying for the same, the same uh, recognition. I think she ended up with uh, three honorary doctorate degrees uh, by the time of her uh, passing. You know, I'll, since you mentioned hearing in children, I will tell you that because I'm often asked how that happened and, and uh, how we got into that. So I was pretty new at the University of Colorado, uh, 1970 maybe on the faculty, when I got a proposal from Williams and Wilkins book publishers. And someone had submitted, an audiologist had submitted an outline for a book on pediatric audiology. That was the title of it, I think. Um, and they asked me to review the proposal and give them an opinion whether it was a valuable book or not. Um, you know, asking me for an opinion at that early age in my career, boy, I looked over that, uh, that uh, uh, submission, that application for it, and it was really boring. I mean, it was really dull. It was about as boring and uninteresting as you can imagine. So I happened to give the, the book a rather critical uh, review. But I concluded by saying we really did need a book 
uh, in the field on pediatric audiologists because none, none existed at that point. So I got a call back very shortly after that saying, well, if you're so damn smart, why don't you write the book? <laughs> um, I said, sure, I could do that, knowing full well that I really couldn't, uh, and promptly went down the hallway to ask Marion Downs if she would help me write a book on pediatric, and of course, she was happy to do that. So we signed a contract, and uh, they called us back in about a year and said, how's it going? And I said, oh, fabulous. We're just, we're just moving along when we actually hadn't written a single page of it. Uh, they called about six months later, said, I, I, are you ready? We're almost there. We're almost there. I That's down, kind of the way books go, though, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I went down to Marion and said, you know, they're really bugging us. we got to do something. She said, okay, that's uh, we can do that. And sure enough, we cranked out that first edition of Hearing and Children in about six months. But in doing that, I have to say, we stayed in that office till dark every single night. And we were back at our desks at uh, 6 a.m. in the morning. Uh, we divided up the book nicely into pieces that she had expertise in and pieces that I had expertise in. Uh, it came out pretty well. Uh, I remember thinking, oh, my God, I can't believe I really wrote a book. I hope, I hope I never have to do that again. Uh, and, uh, and it caught on right away because there was just a need for that book. Once again, right place, right timing, uh, great opportunity. Um, interesting as an additional uh, Editions of it came out in later years. Marion got kind of bored with it. Um, she helped a little in the second edition, but by the time the third, fourth, fifth, sixth editions came, I have to say that uh, Marion was not very involved in those. Um, it had just kind of moved on beyond her. I loved keeping her name in the book and sharing the royalties with her. Uh, that was the least I could do to, to honor her for all she had done for me. Yeah, yeah. I still remember as a as a uh, intern. Marion called me into her office one day and said, "You know, uh, this these are the these are the kind of the drawings we're going to put in the book. What do you think?" And it's like, "What do I think? What? Why would anybody care what I think?" And uh, and they were the the sum of the drawings that are still in the book. Uh, yeah, the pictures. Quite a quite an interesting thing for an intern to have any we input had, on. We had a, a resident in our program at that time who had come to us from Israel, and he brought his wife. And I visited their home one day. They invited me for dinner one evening. I went to their home and I realized that there were all these beautiful drawings all over this house. And it turned out that his wife was an artist. And uh, so that was the opening. Next wow. thing I took, I tore out a bunch of photographs and pictures that I liked that would fit our chat, fit. Took them to her and asked her to do a drawing that I could use as, on the cover of Hearing and Children. So I came back, I guess a few weeks later, and she laid out about eight pictures for me. And she said, you know, choose one of these if you think one of these would fit your cover. And she had a really stylistic approach of just using a pen, drawing very quickly. And the drawing would be a line drawing, but it looked like she never really picked her pen up like she did, all, did them all together. Fabulous pictures. And I said, oh, my gosh, I can't pick one. What if I, what if I try to use them all? And she hesitated and she said, well, I, I you know, I'm a professional artist. I'd, I'd have to charge you to use my work like that. And I said, well. I don't know, what would that cost? And she said, would $10 a picture be too much? And I said, <laughs> I mean, so I took all the pictures and managed to fit each one of them to a chapter in the book. So I kept those pictures through all six editions. Uh, I've always liked them. Um, I have changed the cover a little bit once in a while. Uh, the first cover showed a baby um, in embryo with a little ear yeah. hole. I don't know if you recall that or not. I do. Yeah, that's the one I saw. And then, that came off of a little brochure that I took to her out of our uh, OBGYN clinic that they gave to new mothers. And she redrew it and put up. And I got complaints from that because I, I don't know what people thought. They did not like the idea of this, this baby in utero. So in future editions, I had to take the in utero background out of the picture and just left the little baby with an ear horn on it. So anyway, that was sort of the characteristic profile of the book. Well, that that is a legend in pediatric audiology, and we'll talk more about that here in just a little bit. Um, but you know, I again, as a student uh, of audiology, I think I was a doc student at the time. Uh, you and your colleagues at American Electromedics were kind enough to let me run the slide projector or something to give me a deal <laughs> because 
no one had taught in us anything about impedance audiometry, which later became emittance audiometry. And, and it added greatly to my education to do that. But, and, and I think you guys must have done what three, oh, I mean, uh, over a three year period, you did like a hundred courses all around the country. Well, let's, let's go back to the beginning of that. So picture in your mind, if you will, that in audiology clinics, there was no middle, no way to measure the middle ear. Um, a pathology. All we could do is compare bone conduction measurements to, to air conduction measurements and, and make deductions about what's going on in the middle ear, whether it was an air bone gap, etc. And there was no way to differentiate among air bone gaps. We, it was a gap or not a gap. Uh, when in Denmark, suddenly uh, 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 someone invented the uh, a clinical, what we call then an impedance meter, they brought it over and showed it to uh, Jim Jerger. And he just took onto it immediately, recognizing how important this could be for differentiating middle ear disorders. That's where it started. Um, the, uh, the sales of that instrument was uh, turned over to an American entrepreneur named Erwin Klar. And somehow Klar and Jürger got together and designed a, a two-day course that they would, that they put on in some sample city uh, and drew people to come to this course to learn how to do, quote, impedance, or as you say, emittance audiometry. And they set up, I think, a dozen machines at tables, three people to a table. And it was a two-day course. But uh, Jerger was going to teach it, but he couldn't stay the whole time. So they en ended up inviting me to come and give a portion of the course. Well, it was a very successful course. I have to say that I think all 12 people are, they must have sold all 12 instruments that the people were just carrying them out under their arm because they realized what an important uh, addition that would be to clinical testing. So the success of that program then put us all together, ended up putting together, as you point out, I think 90 some courses that were taught all over the world and around the United States. And I found myself on this, on this escapade of teaching one of these courses once a month. Uh, so I would get off on a Friday, teach this course on a Friday, Saturday, and be back home. And we just taught it in every city. It just really exploded. People were very interested in it. We, uh, the courses were always full. We then had advanced impedance courses, admittance courses. We then had international uh, admittance courses. So there was a period in the early 70s, probably 73, 74, up through 1980s, uh, where these courses were going on. And literally, I think we, we taught every audiologist who had the slightest bit of interest uh, attended one of those courses. Well, that turned out again to be a great opportunity for me. Not only was it a lot of travel, but I got to meet audiologists from around the world, all kinds of audiology leaders. Uh, and that uh, uh, was very beneficial to me in later years as I put together conferences and meetings and, and books and so forth. I, I just had uh, innumerable contacts of really, really good, strong people. That was formidable times for a lot of us. Uh, I know uh, I can think of five or six colleagues that uh, we all sat back and said, wow, if we could only do that. Uh, you set the press that you and uh, Bill Carver, I think, were some of the first people to really cross the line from clinic and academics into some of the commercial kinds of things and set the example for all of us, which actually led to later uh, audiologists being hearing aid reps and and those of us that did consulting with, with companies later on. This was the beginning of that component of the profession for all of us. I think what it was the beginning of, Bob, was the beginning of, um, of bringing people together to have a practical kind of a course. That had not been done in, in our field before. And so the outline of that, with people working on instrumentation, practicing on each other, that's what really developed over the years so that we then had courses in ceruminectomies, in balance and vestibular disorders, where people would come together, sit at instruments, work on each other, get practice, and then, you know, go out and apply that in the clinics. I think that was really the key to those uh, early admittance courses. That's what that brought about. Well, there was there was a uh, one of the ads I'll never forget that had a great big picture of a thing like this that said "stick it in your ear," and and, the, and I looked for that somewhere any place on the internet. I never could find it. I had to 
I had to look around for it. I couldn't find one, and I, I'm sure I got a book around here that's got that in there somewhere. But um, well, that uh, along the way, we uh, Irwin Clark developed what he called a tiponometer, and it was a little uh, small device, uh, just a small box device that had a little handheld probe, and it would trace the child's tympanogram. You tear it off, and there you go. And the theme for that whole little tiponometer was stick it in your ear because yeah. we could say that to kids, we could say that to, to parents put a little bit of humor on the whole uh, the whole testing procedure. So I understand you there were some uh, some some things with uh, with the courses that were of interest uh, in various parts of the world. Well, um, I, I think you're probably referring to a, a trip I made to the, to the Himalayas in Nepal. Uh, I've always been a, a, a big mountain person uh, being a Colorado guy myself. And I've always been a Mount Everest buff. Uh, I've read everything about Mount Everest that ever existed, articles, books about mountain climbing. I've just been an armchair mountaineer, if you will. But anyway, in 1984, I had an opportunity to go to the base camp of Everest. And I just, gosh, I was so excited about that. I was going with one of the very early adventure group companies. They were putting 12 people together to, uh, to walk from Kathmandu to the base camp of Everest. And I joined that, but I started thinking about that. And I thought, you know, uh, all those little children that live up there in the Himalayas, I wonder what their eustachian tube function is. In fact, if I could put together a project, a research project, I could probably write this whole trip off of my taxes as a, as a business expense. So I got together with my, uh, my uh, audiology friend from Denver, my good audiology friend from Denver, Daryl Teeter. I talked him into coming along with me to help me with this project in the Himalayas. So I contacted the adventure company and asked them if that would be a problem. They said, no, they could, we could work on that. I then called uh, Paul Madsen from the Madsen company who made the earliest uh, admittance meters. Because the problem was really that there was no electricity at these primary schools up in the Himalayas. And I asked him if he had a battery operated unit. And he said, well, we have a prototype, uh, Jerry, of, a, of, a, of an admittance meter that it's not very portable because it takes 24 uh, D batteries, the biggest size, large D batteries. It takes 24 of them. And I said, well, that, that might work for me. Let me see. So I called the adventure company back and said, oh, my gosh, I've got this battery operated piece of equipment. I, I know we're going to visit a, a primary school along the way um, up in the Himalayas. What if I worked out a project with the children from that school? Would that be a problem? I said, oh, well. No, that would be pretty good. That'd be pretty interesting for our whole group, as a matter of fact. But uh, we can't carry that instrument. You'd have to hire your own yak and your own Sherpa to be in charge of that. We can't be responsible for that. I said, well, I could, I could work that out. So indeed, uh, off we went. I hired my own yak, my own uh, Sherpa, who followed us all the way from Kathmandu to uh, about uh, 15,000 feet where this uh, little primary school was existed. I had written the school principal and we were all set to go. Uh, he had the children all lined up. There was no electricity in this school. So all the little kids showed up and they were all bundled up because it was cold up there. and They were kind of dirty and kind of ruffled, but they were really cute little first graders. And I was going to do um, a tympanometry and try to measure your station tube function on these people that lived at 15,000 feet. For, I don't know what I was thinking, but so we get to the school um, and Daryl Teeter now has stepped forward to help me. And I unload, I open up the case that the meter's in and all the batteries are just scattered all over the place from being carried by this yak for uh, 20 miles. Half the batteries were dead uh, because it was so cold at night there. So I had to put that all together and re repackage the unit, but I got it working. Pretty excited about that. And as the first little child showed up, I said to Daryl, uh, hand me the probe tips. And he said, I, I, there's no probe, I don't, there's no probe tips here. I don't see any. And I said, well, there must be. Uh, I packed everything. I'm sure I got the probe tips. Well, lo and behold, it turned out I forgot the probe tips. Uh, we were all this, what, 8,000 miles from home. This <laughs> special piece of equipment hauled by a yak. And the whole project was going down the toilet because I had forgotten the probe tips. So we talked together quickly and decided to do a little hearing test on all the children. We would just screen their hearing. Uh, recognizing that we couldn't do impedance measurements on them. And 
nobody seemed to be the wiser in our group. They couldn't really tell what we were doing. We gave each of the kids a little balloon and a pencil when they were done. So the kids were happy. And uh, we sort of quietly uh, packed our gear and went on the way to Mount, Mount Everest without, without ever describing much of what happened to anybody. Kind of a secret between Daryl Teeter and myself all these years, honestly. <laughs> well, you know, and, uh, and, and on and on into uh, books of hearing disorders, three editions, and being a founder of seminars in hearing and uh, seminars in speech language pathology as well. Uh, these are the stories that these publications are made from and, uh, and, and a life in audiology. You know, the uh, Colorado Hearing Foundation, I think, uh, I think it lists, it started in 1974 uh, and it's been around for 50 years plus or whatever. And uh, well, that's uh, kind of an interesting development as well. Um, Marion Downs uh, and I, uh, in those early years, the early 70s, it actually started before I came back to the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Marion Downs and the chief of otolaryngology, uh, Garth Hemingway, had gotten a grant uh, from NIH, I think, where they were going to bring together 10 audiologists and 10 otologists to try to put these two together to see if they couldn't create a cooperative, improved uh, hearing assessment clinical program if these two groups would sit down and talk together. Because up to that point, they'd been sort of strangers to each other. So they met in Estes Park. And actually, George Von Beckesee was a uh, speaker at that very first meeting. I was not there. Um, the next year, they got funding again for the meeting because it was pretty successful. But the funding came late. Uh, and they, they had a very short period of time to, to put it into place or they were going to lose the funding. And I showed up and said, oh, gosh, it's winter. Let's do a ski meeting. And I said, that's a good idea. We'll, use, we'll do a ski meeting. We'll bring 10 otologists, 10 audiologists together at Vail, and we'll use Garth Hemingway's uh, uh, condo, and we'll just have a meeting there, and we'll use the funds that way. Well, again, that was just a successful endeavor. Uh, I kind of grabbed it at that point and took off with it. And as you well know, Bob, we ran that ski meeting uh, for otology and audiology for 30 years. Uh, it was a successful meeting, a fabulous meeting. Um, but, the color, but when I try, I ran it through the medical school to begin with. But unfortunately, the medical school would not pay for liquor. They would not let us up. They wouldn't reimburse us for liquor. They wouldn't reimburse the speakers prior to the meeting so that some of the speakers had to put out their own money and then wait for a reimbursement, which might take up to three months from the medical school to process it. Uh, and there just were a lot of limitations, including the fact that the medical school wanted 10% of the proceeds of the meeting. And I could see that they really didn't do anything. We did the whole meeting ourselves. So I got the grand idea to just go start our own nonprofit corporation, which I did. Uh, we've changed the name several times, but it's now the Colorado Hearing Foundation. And we ran the meeting for 25 years out of that organization instead of running it out of the medical school. And so uh, the meeting continued to be very successful in its heyday. I would say we had 250 or 300 attendees. We would meet in the morning, early morning, we'd meet with breakfast. Uh, we'd stop at uh, 9.30 when the lifts began to run. Everybody would ski all day long and come back at four o'clock and we'd have meetings from four o'clock till seven o'clock in the evening. So it was uh, uh, very popular, uh, a fabulous science meeting in spite of the fact it was held in a recreational kind of environment. For a, for a young audiologist, uh, the ski meeting was where we learned uh, uh, mountains about the profession from some of the some of the most influential people in in the field, as well as since we didn't have you know um, many of our schools with when DU kind of went into demise, many of our schools weren't the Northwesterns or uh, Vanderbilts or some of these kinds of places, and so this is where we met the the, the high level individuals, some of the giants of their time. And also uh, won medals like this little NASTAR medal that <laughs> that I still remember. I did have one that was higher than a bronze, but I can't find it anymore. So I'm sure, that, I'm sure that's what you're saying now. Well, that's what I'm saying now. Of course. Yeah, it's easy to say so. now. <laughs> uh, yeah, we did it. We had a ski race. We had a NASTAR ski race in the middle of our meeting on Thursday. Always, it was called the Big Ear, the Big Ear Ski Race, and we videotaped it, and then we would show it at night at a banquet. 
But of course, it was very funny because people skied horribly and they fell and they crashed and they burned. Oh, sure. and that, that was really that was really pretty fun. But Bob, you know, that was a good connection for me because that ski meeting, I was able to invite all those faculty people that I met earlier in my career uh, when I was at Walter Reed and when I was the Army representative to NIH to uh, for the Surgeon General's office to all. You know, I was able to meet a lot of really um, key people that were putting together the hearing science that ultimately became what we know as audiology. But because of that, I was able to invite people like Joe Zwislaki and J.D. Harris and Chuck Berlin and um, just, just, just on and on. Um, people that I had met along the way, Jack Vernon, um, Nelson, just so many. And I was able to bring them as faculty to the ski meeting, which in you know, increase the value of the ski meeting immensely. Um, and we just always had this super faculty that couldn't be matched anyplace else. And those of us that were kind enough uh, to get a scholarship, not total scholarship, of course, but enough of a scholarship to make it and run the slide projector and do a few little things uh, around the around the meeting. Um, you know, my kids actually grew up at skiing at that meeting. <laughs> they... Uh, they they used to get a bus. That's what I remember best about you, Bobby. You were always on hand to run the run the projector. Uh, <laughs> whether it was at the Peens course or the ski meeting, <laughs> symposium, I can always turn to you and say, hey, Bob, would you mind running the projector? Hopefully that uh, will carry a little bit of a scholarship with it. Maybe not a whole <laughs> one, but, uh, you know, and 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 I will never forget my, 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 I think my first and only presentation at the ski meeting was, um, it dealt with audio and implants and a new processor for the implants and that kind of thing. And you talk about intimidation for a young doctoral level audiologist with, uh, with Mead Killian, Chuck Berlin, you, Blair Simmons, Daryl Teeter, virtually all these people in the front row that I, that I expect. And after lots of sweat that went into the talk and dripping with sweat when I finished, it was such a kind group that uh, welcomed uh, young presenters to the stage and, and made suggestions here and there as to how you could make it a little better for the next talk. You know, another thing about that meeting, the faculty people would tell me that they would often bring their newest research and present it to that group because there was such a, star, a strong collection of people um, at the program. They wanted to hear it. They wanted to present their information there early and get feedback on it before they went to publication. So that was one of their, their incentives for coming and speaking at the uh, audiology uh, meeting, at ski meeting, as we call it. Wow. Well, the, there's also uh, the, you, know, you mentioned Chuck Berlin, there's also the Jerry and Chuck show that went on at that, at that meeting virtually every time. And we all look so forward to that. I mean, here's one of the masters of emceeing meetings, <laughs> meeting the master of the piano, and ABR and a number of other things that went on in the profession at the time. You know, that Chuck Berlin was just such a great friend and a great pianist. You know, if there was a piano anywhere within 500 yards of a meeting, Chuck Berlin would sit down and just play for hours and hours. And somehow we would all, we had a banquet at the ski meeting, always at the end where we would hand out our medals for the ski race and sort of jokingly make fun of people for the, for the evening, kind of roast them, uh, if you will. And Chuck and I would spend a few minutes uh, on that day early, and we work out a little performance where I would I would say something, and then he would play a piano musical tune to match whatever I was talking about, and then we would go back and forth. Yeah. Well, gosh, we took that little dog and pony show all kinds of places. Uh, as it turned out, and people would invite us; they'd invite me to be the MC and and him to be the piano player. And uh, I guess we were the mutton Jeff of. Uh, of the audiology world as we went around with this little dog and pony show. Well, I think that also uh, bled into the, as you were a board member of the Jackson Hole Rendezvous, uh, they bled into that meeting also, from what I gather. Well, you know, um, the Jackson Hole Rendezvous, Rendezvous was another very famous meeting because it was held in such a beautiful place. It's held in the summer, not the ski meeting. Um, Michael Marion, an audiologist, uh, uh, put that together. He was from uh, Wyoming and uh, called it the, uh, the, the Rendezvous, which was a pretty catchy little name. And it operated the same way. We'd meet in the mornings, we'd meet in the afternoons and leave the day open for hiking, horseback riding, 
It always ended with a uh, float trip for the whole group down down the Snake River, right in front of the Grand Teton. So it was a, a beautiful meeting. And uh, yeah, I was uh, proud to be a speaker there many, many times and, and work with Michael on his board as he put the meeting together. We That met every other year, as I recall. Not every year, it was every other year. It was, it was absolutely super. But I think one of the one of the crowning engagements that you had was your time with an old friend of both of ours, Dr. Gus Mueller, uh, <laughs> and the trivia bowl. Yeah, <laughs> the trivia bowl, the trivia bowl uh, started with the beginning of the American Academy of Audiology. Um, I let's see, I don't know how much detail to go into, but I'd been appointed by ASHA at that point because we didn't have an academy to be the uh, convention chair in Seattle for that year, which probably was 1989. Uh, So I was the chair, but before you could be the chair, you had to serve on the convention committee for ASHA. And I served on the convention committee in charge of hearing disorders. I had to bring together people to read all of the papers that were being submitted for hearing disorders at the ASHA convention. And we would choose which papers would be presented and which ones would uh, unfortunately be rejected. Well, rather than send all these papers out to five people, I just invited them to Colorado and said, let's all sit together down one time. We'll go over the papers all at once. And by the way, I happen to have a mountain home over there by Aspen. uh, And why don't we just meet there for a weekend? That would be really cool. So they all jumped right on that. And so that weekend involved Gus Mueller, myself, Linda Hood, Brad Stack, Fred S., I guess there were five of us. Did I leave anybody out? I don't think so. And we sat down. Of course, we did all the papers in about two hours. And they were done. We had the whole weekend left. So uh, Brad and uh, Gus showed up with a trunk full of beer uh, in their car. And we sat on our deck and really discussed world affairs, as you can imagine. And, of course. Uh, some gossip and stuff. And all of a sudden, Gus began to tease us with a little bit of audiology trivia. It's just sort of a funny little way. Do any of you guys know what such and such and such is? I was aware at the time that the University of Colorado had a very well-known trivia bowl where the University of Colorado and Boulder, there would be championship teams come in from all the universities and they would have this big trivia blowout uh, once a year on their campus. And so the idea came together, why don't we, uh, and Gus and, and Tom Mueller, Tom uh, Powers, and maybe Brad, had just come from a bar where they had started those trivia games in a bar someplace. And they thought they were pretty smug and smart because they all had PhDs. But it turned out they lost that night to a group of secretaries that were sitting, <laughs> young female ladies that were sitting by them. So that irritated them. But anyway, uh, the short of the story is uh, on that deck that day, we decided to try an audiology trivia bowl and we would do it at the American Academy of Audiology. And, Gus and I would put together the questions, and then I would be the uh, the presenter. I would be the Alec Rebeck of, of the system. I would present the questions. Gus would come on afterwards, and he would give all the answers. Well, that just turned out to be giantly more successful than we ever, ever anticipated until it became a, uh, a major part of the American Academy of Audiology Convention. And so on the last day of the convention, Saturday at noon, sponsored by Siemens, uh, for the entire time, we did it for 25 straight years. We had the annual American Academy of Audiology Trivia Bowl. And we would ask questions about hearing, hearing disorders, uh, current events that had to do with hearing or hearing disorders or vestibular things, all related to audiology, but really tough little questions. And the uh, contest, the attendees would sit at tables of 10. They would make up a little trivia team names and we'd have a team competition with prizes at the end. And it was just a fun, fun activity and a real challenge for um, people to see if they can outsmart us in their knowledge of trivia. Well, as a member of the phonemic regressives, uh, I can say that we uh, we uh, totally missed the trivia bowl <laughs> at AAA. Uh, and uh, uh, now, did you have some other fabulous team names well, that, was, that was kind of the fun because we also had a contest among all the people to among all the tables to come up with the best trivia name each year and then we'd bring me killian up on the stage with his little sound level meter which he always carried in his pocket we would have applause for each of the, the each of the candidate names and the biggest applause name would 
get a prize for their table. And people were incredibly clever uh, with their names. Phonemic regressives, you know, that was a that was a pretty good name. And I think you guys are pretty successful, weren't you, in your team over the years? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Won a few times, won a few times. But we joined we joined them uh, after maybe seven eight years, but uh, finally we joined in, and uh, and and it was a it was a good group. You know, the, the names that I always liked best were the ones that had to do with ears or hearing. Uh, people often had names that had to do with the city where we were meeting or current events or movie titles or something that was going on in the press at that time. But I always liked the names that had to do mostly with hearing one way or another. So I'm going to give you a few samples of what came up. There was a group called 2DB or 2DB, um, Concha Hear Us. Um, the sissies, they were stupid is as stupid is, you know, that was a, at the time of, of that movie as well. The ear resistibles, uh, the seruminators, um, so good it hurts. That, that was the name of one team and bad hair cell days. Uh, and they just went on and on. Yeah. Uh, we often had as many as uh, 50 tables of 10 at the meeting. So there were a lot of names, but my favorite, my, my outright favorite, was uh, Narhart's Crotch. Oh, yeah. Was, oh, yeah. Narhart's Crotch. That was an early name that was so good, no one ever used it again afterwards. Oh, so it was absolutely fabulous. It just stood by itself. So uh, did you have a favorite question that you remember from the Trivia Bowl at all, Jerry? Oh, gosh, that, that is tough. I don't know. Um, you know, we have a uh, – <clears throat> we we put together a CD – uh, that is available on Gus Mueller's website. And you could go to gusmueller.com. I guess that's his website. Or fungus.com or something like that. And, yeah. And you can find the American Academy of Audiology trivia questions for all 25 years and the answers. And as a matter of fact, the, uh, the best team names for that whole period of 25 years. Oh. So that's, that's a pretty fun website. And, uh, and if you have absolutely nothing else to do in your life, that would be a way to waste a sense of valuable time. That's well, I mean. speaking of absolutely nothing to do, there was one uh, project that has been relatively recent uh, that that I know you were intimately involved in. And I was lucky enough to be uh, put on the committee for. And that would be how to eat like an audiologist. And uh, so it's kind of an audiology cookbook that uh, you actually uh, funded the publishing of for the Academy. Well, that was a project. Uh, we were actually meeting a group of us. Um, we were in Phoenix. We were attending the uh, uh, American Auditory Society meeting. And then we ended up at a restaurant. You know, there were, what, about six of us, I think, uh, around the ground table. After about the third bottle of wine, somehow we were talking about the dinner that went into recipes that went into cookbooks and all of a sudden it came up why don't we do an audiology cookbook every organization has a cookbook and we would just do it on behalf of the american academy of audiology foundation we put all the proceeds into the foundation for sales of the cookbook and the six of us would underwrite the cost of publishing the cookbook and so i said yeah that's a great idea off we went we set it up. Of course, we met up in Bismarck, North Dakota, Gus Mueller's house for a weekend. And it was you and your lovely wife, Krista. Georgine Ray was there. Myself, Gus, and his wife, Karen, uh, six of us. And over that weekend, then, we laid out the, the, uh, the strategic plan, if you will, for how to put this cookbook together. So we wrote to 100 audiologists, I think, asked them for their favorite recipe and some other little tidbits about themselves. And they sent them all in, we put it all together, laid it all out, and in fact, got it published, uh, supported a little bit by the Colorado Hearing Foundation in the end, because we didn't quite have enough funds to pull it off. The Academy distributed, and I think it made some money, hopefully, uh, for the American Academy of Audiology Foundation. It was, it was a, a fun, 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 fun it was project. It was a fun, fun project, yeah, what the heck. And in fact- The ad hoc, the ad hoc cook, cookbook committee. Well, and uh, and we got to tour all the breweries in uh, in Bismarck, North Dakota. Yes, Plus, there is uh, I only took second place in the Crow <laughs> Shoes contest, uh, but I understand you guys were the first place. Well, you know, Gus invented uh, Gus had the whole weekend laid out 
for he's us. A, if you he's were. a great inventor, of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He'd been to a lot of meetings and he laid out a whole formal uh, organization of what we would do for two days. But he wanted to be sure that it was not all business. And it was a lovely time of year. So we went out into his yard and he had invented a game called Crow Shoes. Crow Shoes. And it was kind of a combination game between croquet and horseshoes. And we divided up in teams and play this game. And of course, we had a tailgate uh, uh, set up right there by the game so we could uh, keep ourselves well hydrated uh, during the match. And as I recall, my team won, Bob, and I'm so sorry you came in second place. Well, that's okay. There are probably a third place uh, team as well. And we're, <laughs> we're, we're middle of the rotors. Um, I think on a more serious note, Jerry, um, uh, on behalf of my colleagues in the American Academy of Audiology and around the profession, uh, you have uh, graciously uh, presented the Jerry Northern Scholarship in Pediatric Audiology to our young uh, uh, developing colleagues in the area of pediatrics. Um, well, that's that's nice of you to bring that up, Bob, and I appreciate your, uh, your comments. Um, in my retirement, you know, you'll all you audiologists will figure that out. In your retirement, you might want to still be involved a little bit in audiology at your own level. And, and uh, I wanted to give back. I know that's kind of a cliche, but I really wanted to give back to this profession that had been so good to me all the 50, 60 years that I had been involved. And I decided a, a way to do that would be to, to provide scholarships to young AUD students who were committed to work in pediatrics. That, that was my interest. So I was fortunate enough to be able to uh, fund uh, three scholarships a year at $10,000 a piece uh, to young uh, AUD students in their third and fourth year, also to help offset uh, the huge demand for scholarships, I'm sorry, the huge demand for tuition fees uh, that they were undergoing with student debt and so forth. I thought scholarships would be a way to out in that arena as well, as to ensure that we would have good qualified people continuing in pediatric audiology. And so it's been underway for three years. I think I have funded uh, 10 incredibly uh, valuable, well-trained uh, uh, AUD candidates who will go on with pediatric careers. We will have three more uh, next year. And hopefully if all goes well, perhaps I can extend the funding and and keep that program going. It's a program I'm, I'm very proud of and happy to do that in my uh, retirement years. And I'm able to do that through my Colorado Hearing Foundation, which, which continues uh, to this day. And I might add that those of you who want to read a little more about Dr. Northern, as well as look more into uh, the Colorado Hearing Foundation, uh, you can find that at ColoradoHearingFoundation.org. Um, Jerry, you'll, see, you'll, you'll yeah. see a couple of other pro you'll see a couple of other projects on there, Bob, that we support. Um, one is we work with Children's Hospital in Denver, and we support uh, Dory's Discovery Days, uh, named for my uh, mother-in-law, as a matter of fact, Dora Segar. And we put a, a summer camp on for uh, hearing impaired and deaf children from the uh, Colorado Children's Hospital, and we do that every year. We've done that now for maybe 12 or 14 years. And we support the Hope School here in Spokane, Washington, uh, where my daughter is the head uh, teacher. And it's a, a preschool for uh, hearing impaired kids uh, right here in town. So I've been able to stay active in a lot of audiology activities through those kinds of things, which I'm, I'm grateful for and, and which I enjoy a lot. Jerry, um, this has been a very, very special uh, interview for me. Um, as uh, uh, to interview one of my mentors, uh, a guy who was on my doctoral committee, and I stand on on shoulders of the giants of our profession. And thank you well, very much for your time, energy, and effort that went into today's discussion. Well, thank you. It was a nice trip uh, back in, in memories and uh, reminiscences for me. So uh, always fun and always good to see you, Bob. Uh, thanks for having me.